What's up, guys? Rick from DFS On Demand here with a preview for the Memorial Tournament. Before we jump into that, really quickly, I do want to look back at the Charles Schwab Challenge. I have a tool on DFS On Demand, my website, um, that is free for everyone uh, that I, I wanted to point out here because it's been um, bringing up a lot of conversation recently. So this is the live leaderboard tool that I'm showing on the video version of this that as far as I'm aware is the only uh, golf leaderboard that updates essentially in real time that offers DraftKings salary and fantasy points. So you can see exactly uh, where all of your players stand. And then also includes the strokes gained information. Um by round. So you can click through and choose, you know, round one, round two, any combination of the four, um, and see where your golfers, uh, currently are. As of right now, it is updating every hour during the tournament. Um, I'm looking to speed that up, but this is here for you. Um, a couple of things that I like to take out of this, and I think they'll be relevant for this week is I like to sort this by T to green. So guys that gained the most strokes T to green, uh, for example, last week. So this was the Charles Schwab and then lost strokes putting and then see if there are any targets for this week. So for example, Nick Watney T8 last week led the field in T to green. He was three shots better T to green than Kevin Na, the eventual winner was. Uh, lost four strokes putting. So that is an opportunity for him to bounce back. He catches a pot, a hot putter and uh, he's in business. Same with someone like Billy Horschel, who finished T19th, but was like seventh in strokes gained T to green. Joaquin Neiman, also interesting, right? Lost over four strokes putting. And uh, Corey Connors, he always loses strokes putting and he's always great T to green, but he shows up here too. So that's just something I, I really wanted to point out to you because we're going to talk about some of these names in a minute. And this tool is here. You can check it out. Um, I'll link it in the description. Um, have at it. Additionally, um, you can click the other tabs here. There is an optimals tab. So this is currently, or whenever this is updated, the most optimal lineups that you could have put together on DraftKings under the $50,000 salary cap. Um, now that the tournament is over, these are the, the finished ones from last week. So uh, what is happening and what is kind of causing a little bit of uh, discussion on Twitter is the fact that these totals rarely like these optimal lineups rarely get close to 50,000. I think one or two weeks in recent memory, they've been like 49, nine or $50,000. A lot of them are in the $47,000 range and the $48,000 range, sometimes even lower optimal lineup here. Number two, which was Blixed, Finau, Kevin Na, Ryan Palmer, CT Pan, and Andrew Putnam was 46,600. And this creates a lot of discussion I'm not going to go into now. I'll have, this will be a separate video or blog post or something. But um, there's this discussion around, well, this is a silly thing to look at because no one's ever going to enter these lineups. No one's ever going to enter a lineup that has $47,500 uh, instead of spending $50,000. And I don't disagree with that, but maybe people should be. Um, I will oftentimes, lead, you know, if I run an optimizer leave uh, max it at 49,000 or max it at 48,000. It gives you a unique lineup. And then additionally, um, you know, it's just going to, it's going to give you different builds and there really isn't, uh, you know, the argument is that in the PGA, it's the one sport where there really isn't that big of a difference between someone who might be seven, the $507,000, for example, uh, just because it is so volatile. And like, I would never do something like this in basketball where the scoring is, is much more consistent on a nightly basis, but uh, it, it brings up a, a really interesting discussion. So I want to show that you that this is here. And then the third tab is just a data visual that I create where you can kind of see the strokes gained um, from each category and how it's adding up to their strokes gain total. So wanted you to make sure, wanted to make sure that you knew this was here is you do not have to be a subscriber for it. You can just check it out. No worries. Um, but yeah, just Wanted to shout it out, and now we'll jump over to the cheat sheet. So what do we have here? The Memorial Tournament Muirfield Village Golf Club. It is in Ohio. This is 
a smaller field, 122 players currently in it. We're keeping our eyes on guys like Louis Eustace and Justin Thomas, uh, Jason Kokrak, for example, who are still currently in the field but have withdrawn recently. We will wait and see if those guys actually end, end up teeing it up. No surprise here to have five guys over $10,000 led by Rory McIlroy, who I don't think a lot of people realize that he finished well at the PGA Championship. He ends up backdooring a top 10, which I understand is not the sexiest. He was never really in contention of the PGA, but hey, he finds himself in a top 10, which is now two straight top 10s, a 21st at the Masters. Um, Rory has rattled off a handful of top 10s here in the past, including an eighth place finish last year, a fourth in 2016. I mean, the guy is uh, one of the best players on the planet, if not the best right now, uh, continues to post great results. And he's going to continue to be kind of this mid 11s. The guy that's most interesting is Tiger, who obviously wins the Masters, uh, misses the cut at the PGA, and now we sit here and say, like, what, what am I doing with Tiger? Um, what I think we have seen in the most recent version of Tiger is the more he plays, the better he gets, um, which was not always the case with Tiger, right? He would always only play the WGCs. He'd play the majors, the big events. He'd have one of the smallest schedules on the PGA Tour. Then we saw him last year play a lot more events, especially compared to what we have seen uh, in other iterations of Tiger and kind of got it going and played really, really well. So I think this is the type of, uh, of uh, version of Tiger where he really needs to knock the rust off. So I'm glad to see he's going to tee it up a couple weeks in a row now. So I'm not necessarily thrilled to go get him. Um, you know, after missing cut, after missing the cut at the PGA championship and then, you know, sitting it out last week to go get him this week, but I'm very interested and we're going to reassess this again next week. Um, you know, when he tees it up again, I think when he gets more rounds under his belt in a shorter period of time, more competitive rounds, he's, he's a much more appealing option. So I don't think I'll be getting to tiger this week at 11 two, cause there's other great options below him, but that is my thought process on tiger. And it's something that we've kind of seen bear itself out a little bit over the course of the last year or two. I really think this uh, bottom half of the $10,000 range is one of the most interesting ranges. So you have Justin Rose at 10-8, Fowler at 10-6, and Patrick Cantlay at 10-2. And when you look at Rose and Fowler, you know, the last two times they teed up, which was last week at the Charles Schwab, um, you know, both disappoint. Ricky burns everybody with the miscut. Rose did make the cut, but to finish 58th, you know, that, that is still end, ending up being a disappointment when you roster Justin Rose. Um, all three of these guys have, have great recent history at the Memorial. All three finished in the top eight last year. Uh, Justin Rose has a second place finish in 2015. Rory has a second, or I'm sorry, Ricky has a second place two years ago. Cantley has only played here two times, 35th and a fourth. So all three, very, very interesting. Um, I think it's basically whatever you want to get here. I think Cantlay is going to be, or at least should be, fairly popular. His last three starts now are a ninth at the Masters, a three, uh, third place finish at the RBC, and then another third place finish at the PGA. The one concern about Cantlay this week is the, the you know, it's a Jack Nicholas course, a ton of bunkers around the greens. Um, normally, we would say if you have to use your around the green or your scrambling game, in in DraftKings scoring, it probably doesn't matter if you're bad around the greens because if you're having to use it. Um, you're probably not winning the golf tournament anyway. Maybe not the not not the case this week with the way that uh, Muirfield Village does set up. There are a lot of these uh, bunkers near the greens, and they can create some awkward shots or some longer bunker shots. So I am a little bit concerned about Cantlay, but recent form hard to argue with. Ricky's the guy who, if you're willing to get right back on the horse. Um, and forgive him for last week. Maybe it was a letdown week after a major, uh, going to play the Charles Schwab, like great recent form here, uh, would seem to be the type of player that would fit. And we've talked about this before with Ricky, where you're going to get a lot more volatile results, um, in his play than some of these other guys that you might get around the $10,000 range. All right, let's roll through a couple of these really quickly here. So, um, Matt Kuchar at $9,400, I'm imagining is going to suck up a lot of ownership here. So Kuchar, 
uh, he is like built for Muirfield Village, right? If you look at his tournament history, run through this really, really quick. Second in 2011, he won the thing in 2013. Um, 15th and 2014th, then 26th, 4th, 4th, 13th. He is just an absolute stud here. Has not finished outside the top 12 in any golf tournament this year, going back to the Valero Texas Open. That's four straight. Um, just seems to be a really good fit. So if you're playing cash, if you're like, like I imagine that's a free space. With that comes kind of the vacuum where it opens up where, you know, you might not get, unless you're starting your lineups here, you're probably not getting two of these $9,000 guys. So if you go for someone like a Tony Finau, who I might opt to go to in a contrarian type situation, who's coming off a second place finish last week, and I was happy to see that he shot under par on Sunday. The the kind of the knock on Tony at this point is just like, I think he won what? The Puerto Rico Open? Outside of that, he just doesn't really close, doesn't really win. He at least shot under par. Kevin Ott was already in the lead and shot under par as well. So it's, it's tough to knock that. Um, so Tony Finau gets a second last week. He's had great results here at Muirfield Village in the past. He's, you know, three of the last four years, he's finished inside the top 13, has never missed a cut. Um, really good opportunity to get a guy in a good spot who makes a lot of birdies and, you know, improves his draft king, uh, you know, his draft king's uh, finishing position almost always outperforms his PGA Tour uh, finishing position. Moving down to the 9,000 high eight range is, is something interesting that's happening this week. And what's really cool is there's there's really a lot of leverage points here. So Xander at 9,000, um, I find incredibly interesting. He He's missed the cut here in his only start, which was last year. Uh, missed the cut at the Charles Schwab. And now you get him at what is a pretty reasonable price. I mean, this guy who we know can compete in the biggest tournaments is the what eighth, twelfth? I mean, geez, oh man, he's like the he's like the fourteenth highest priced golfer, which is probably not where he should be. Um, I want to show you something really quick. If we go to his player profile, so I've got I've got Xander's information up here. Um, I've got his tee to green. This is by round. So looking at his tee to green round, strokes gain tee to green from Thursday at the Charles Schwab, he lost four strokes T to green. That is pretty significantly the worst round of his 2019 season. So going back to, uh, it, this is actually January, so the Tournament of Champions, he has not lost more than two and a half strokes T to green in any round. He loses four on Thursday. He rebounds a little bit, tries to get it back, misses the cut last week, by one shot. Um, I mean, he, and, and even you can see, even in the Friday round where he got it going a little bit, only gained seven tenths of a stroke putting, which we have seen him do much, much better than that at times this year. But that tee to green number really sticks out to me as an opportunity to, to buy back in because I would be very surprised to see Xander Shoffley lose four strokes in a round tee to green, um, probably in any other round this year, quite, quite frankly. And he has, he's done it once and I'm willing to kind of get over it. Played played much better after that. So um, he would be a guy that I'd be interested in giving another chance to uh, you know to to bounce back. And then Bryson, who is your defending champion, has now missed three straight cuts. I'm not really sure what to do with the guy. Um, if I'll I'll pull up his player profile really quickly so we can we can look at that together. But um, it has been a really ugly stretch of golf for Bryson, and you can see Tita Green here. Um, one, two, three, four rounds in a row where he's lost or barely gained. Those are two missed cuts. Um, and he's just not much is going right for him. Okay. Off the tee has been absolutely brutal. You can see almost gains every single round except, uh, those last four where he's missed the cut. His putting numbers, uh, have been volatile all season, but you know, haven't helped recently. Let's look at his approaches. Um, approaches have been all right. Uh, so it's really that off the, that off the tee game. Now we can look at this a couple different ways. Mirfield village has very wide fairways. Um, if you miss them, you are in big trouble, but maybe with how wide they are, uh, and one of the largest percentages of fairways that are going to be hit on tour this year, Bryson can find the short grass a little bit more, get himself in some better positions because his off the tee game has absolutely destroyed him over the course of the last four rounds. So keep keep that in mind if you're willing to go back to Bryson.
Okay, a couple of quick hitters here. Um, Billy Horschel was someone that we mentioned at the very start of this uh, video where he gained a ton of strokes TD green last week and lost putting. He is normally a fairly solid putter. So that is a third of a stroke gained per round. So basically he gains about 1.2 strokes uh, per tournament. And what did he do last week? He lost, uh, Billy, where are you, my friend? He lost 2.6 strokes. So essentially, that, that is a four-stroke difference in his putting stats than what we would see off of his baseline. So that is someone who has a lot of room to improve. Uh, let's see. Oh, and also he has, um, it wasn't recently, it's 2015 and 2014, but he does have an 11th place and a 15th place finish here. He's missed the cut the last two years, but you can at least maybe uh, bank on a little bit of, of course history when it comes to uh, Mr. Billy Horschel. All right, now's the time where, um, you know, we usually just get down into like the low 8,000s and we find value. But I think the best way to find value here is via the course stats. So here's a, a new visual. Um, this launched last week. These are actually the first and 18th holes at, at Mirfield Village. And I've got the um, the hole-by-hole -hole breakdown here for you. So par 72, a lot of par, uh, all these par fives, basically everybody in the field can get to. Uh, the par fours are... Uh, difficult and they're all kind of in that same range, but you'll, you'll see a, a trend on some of these stats here. So highest correlated stats, no surprise to see strokes gain total SDFA scoring average T to green and putts over 10 feet. Those are pretty much staples in the highest correlated stats column for, for most tournaments, but the highest rank stats do tell a story. Um, they are approach stats. So approaches from 150 to 175, 100 to 125, 175 to 200. Again, we've talked about, you know, the sample sizes in these areas, who's hitting from them, et cetera, et cetera. But it's interesting this week because there are some, like you can't just bang it off the tee every single hole. There are some landing areas that you're going to have to find that tend to put a lot of players in the same position. Um, and then the fact that these approach stats keep popping up. You know where we're going to go with this. We're going to look at a lot of the approach numbers. And then the birdie or better from 150 to 175. My best guess on this one is that it is tied to the par fives. The par fives allow so many birdies and, and you know, under par scoring that uh, this tends to be the range that those shots come from. So when you correlate all of these stats against DraftKings scoring and how weighted birdies and eagles are in DraftKings scoring, this really pops off because um, it's the same range that everyone is playing from on some of these par five. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's look at this. Um, I want to look a first at we're going to do the uh, we're going to do the approaches from 150 to 175. This is a uh, a percentage stat, so the higher the better. And number one, shock of the century, Keegan Bradley. Uh, also not surprised to see him be one of the worst in putts over 10 feet, which is another one of our highly correlated stats. Matt Every at $6,800, he's going to make a lot of birdies. Um, his approach game outside of this 150 to 175 is fairly weak. He does gain strokes about a third of a stroke per round, but he is uh, very volatile, of course, if you're going to play him at 6,800. A guy that we haven't talked about in a couple of weeks, uh, Henrik Stenson. So Stenson at $8,500, uh, you know the, that he's going to be, in theory, <laughs> even though we haven't seen that times this year, one of one of the elite um, ball strikers. Now his stats are coming back. He's now one of the best players in strokes gained approach um, this year. He fits the mold of someone who would, should be able to benefit from this Hitting area 150 to 175. He's only $8,500. That's a pretty good spot to be. Um, then worth noting that Matthew Fitzpatrick, Kyle Stanley round out the top five, and Rory is sixth. He is the first uh, guy over $10,000 that we see pop up on our stats here. So I think that stat is usually where the par fives are coming into play. This approaches from 100 to 125 are uh, are usually those other par fours. Okay. So the, the way that, the way that Muirfield village sets up, that's kind of what's happening here. So the guys that you see excel from 100 to 125, Hideki Matsuyama leads the way $9,100. Corey Connors, uh, if uh, two guys that can fire darts, uh, can play well T to green and cannot putt right there for you. 
uh, Hideki and Corey Connors. And then you get Andrew Putnam, which I think is actually kind of interesting. Actually, the next two are interesting. So Andrew Putnam and, and Joaquin Neiman, who you could probably get me to play both of these guys. Um, I played Putnam in some lineups last week. He ends up finishing, I want to say he finished third, T3, or maybe third by himself. But now he gets to a course where this skill set that he has, which is that 100 to 125 yard uh, range, he's the third best. Uh, Neiman kind of similarly finished, I think, 31st last week and left all of those strokes out on the green. And now he gets to a course where maybe if he just putts neutral, he's in contention. So those are two guys in the low 7,000s that I could see as I start to build my lineups really popping up in, in a lot of them. Um, let's do birdie or better. Uh, Justin Thomas leads the way here, still not knowing if he's going to tee it up this week. So we'll kind of pump the brakes there. And then here's the usual suspects, right? It's Gary Woodland. It's Matt Every pops up there. Uh, Jason Day, Bryson DeChambeau, Siwoo Kim, and then Rory again is that first guy over $10,000. But uh, here's where you tend to see a lot of the studs at, at the uh, birdie or better range. And then we will go to... Uh, strokes gained approach. Actually, I want to do two more. So this, this is a long video, but this is a fun one. So um, all good. So here we go. Strokes gained approach. Uh, Henrik Stenson does lead the way, and then you get Keegan, and then you get Justin Thomas. Um, Taylor Gooch played well on Sunday, gave a couple back, ended up finishing in the 30s, I believe, but made a lot of birdies for us last week. Um, he's fourth, and then there you get my main man, Kucher, who you know everyone's going to have. Kucher was basically like, in all the stats that we have discussed, even though I didn't mention him because he wasn't in the top five or six, he was probably in like the top eight to 12 in almost every single one of these categories. And then for the first time, which we don't always do, I do want to look at um, strokes gained around the green. Uh, again, if you have to use it, you're probably in trouble. However, um, this week with the the uniqueness of the, the bunkers and all that good stuff, um, create some awkward situations. So I will look at it really quickly here. Uh, Bud Colley leads the way followed by Benny on. Then you get Louie and Justin Thomas, three and four, two guys that we have no idea if they're even going to tee it up this week or what they, if they're going to play all four rounds, if they do. Um, and then you get Siwoo, Aaron Baddeley, Ernie Els, and Terrell Hatton to round out uh, the rest of those guys. So pretty interesting. All right, that's it for this week at the Memorial. Let me know what you think about that live leaderboard. I hope a lot of you knew that existed. I usually tweet it out, but if not, I hope you enjoy. Let me know what you think, if there's any improvements I can make to it. Uh, tweet me, it's at DFS On Demand, or leave a comment below. I'll talk to you guys soon. Good luck.